Very pleased and we give a warm welcome to David Clinton. Thank you, Robert, for that invitation and for inviting me to be here at the Institute of World Cultures. Um, I'm going to talk today about balancing on a planet. Some people think I'm talking about bounce on a planet. I guess they're related. If you're bouncing on a planet, you've got to be balanced. Um, uh, how do we feed 9 billion is the big question uh, that is on a lot of people's minds. And So I'm going to start off talking about the problem. Uh, we're very, in the big picture, very insignificant in time. Uh, this is the 15 billion year history of the universe, and we're right about there. And actually, the arrow should be up a little bit to the present. We are in the present. We're not in the past. Um, so eventually, eventually, the universe becomes absolute zero, and that's the end of everything. But it's kind of irrelevant to us. We're here in the present. And we're also pretty insignificant in space. We're just a tiny little speck. So the point is that we're, we're, we just have this one planet. One planet in space and time, in a very <coughs> small part of space and a small part of time, uh, this is very insignificant, but this is where we live, and we need to uh, figure out how we can live here, and how we're going to feed uh, 9.3 billion, or whatever, this is just an estimate, we don't know how many people there are going to be uh, by 2050. Uh, we passed the 7 billion mark uh, just recently, a couple of years ago. So who will get to eat what is a question. You can see here two very different kinds of eating. And how will we grow what we, what we eat and what will it cost? What will it cost in social terms, economic terms? What will it cost in environmental terms? What's the solution to this problem? Well, the Neolithic solution is the supply side solution. In other words, as <coughs> demand increases, as population grows, as food consumption grows, the Neolithic solution is to increase supply. Uh, it does that in three major ways, by increasing control over other species, over ecosystems, and over other people. So, this is the, this is my little diagram of different agricultural revolutions. Starting with the Neolithic, uh, that's of course the domestication of, of plants and animals, which started about 13,000 years ago, um, and had, you know, was, had a long, had a long history before that, but finally domestication about 13,000 years ago. And after the domestication, uh, crops and animals spread uh, widely. For example, maize, which was domesticated in southern Mexico about 9,000 years ago, spread uh, throughout the Americas to the rainforests of Brazil, to the uh, <coughs> mountains in the Andes, to the cold uh, areas of North America to the southeast of North America, to the dry deserts of the southwest. So this is the global revolution, the spread of crops. Um, all these revolutions are still ongoing. We're still domesticating crops. Uh, the spread of crops is still ongoing. And in the uh, 18th, or <clears throat> 18th century, we had the beginning of, in the West, the industrial and the scientific uh, revolutions which increased our ability to produce food dramatically through such things as the Haber-Bosch process, which allowed us to use uh, fossil fuels to fix inert nitrogen from the atmosphere, to fix it into reactive nitrogen, into ammonium, that could be used by crops 
And today, for example, about half, about half the protein in the world, including half the human population, is only uh, possible because of the nitrogen that's been fixed through this industrial process. The Green Revolution, starting in the 60s, was the transfer of industrial uh, agriculture from the, from the industrial world, the United States, Europe, and so on, to the third world, to the poorer countries of the global south, um, Mexico, the Philippines, India. <coughs> and finally, today, we have the biotechnology revolution. All these... All these revolutions were what I call supply side. They're, they sought to solve the problem of how do we feed people this question. How we have increasing population, we have a limited ability to produce food. How do we do it? We increase supply. And all of these revolutions were able to um, we're able to increase the supply of food. <coughs> First, the evolution, the management of other species. We interfere in the evolutionary cycles of other species. We change the genetic makeup of other species directly and indirectly to make those species use their uh, genetic information to create more food for human beings. And we have done this uh, first by farmers just collect, uh, selecting seeds that they like, and then plant breeding came in, scientific plant breeding with uh, hybrid maize in the United States in the 1930s was the first uh, crop that was a direct result of scientific breeding. And today, uh, the biotechnology revolution is the most, this is the most rapidly spreading uh, technology ever recorded in agriculture. The spread of genetically engineered or transgenic crop varieties. Uh, as you can see here, this is just 1911. Today, for example, in the United States, over 90% of our soy and our corn are genetically engineered. So this increase, and well, it's a little debatable whether genetically engineered crops have increased yield very much, but uh, they certainly are spreading and their yields are high. The second major thing, because we domesticated the crops, because we selected them to be in service to human beings, therefore their resources are no longer uh, directed to their own survival, so then we have to manage the environments of these plants so that they can grow, because they can't do it on their own anymore. We've eliminated the, uh, their ability to reproduce and to thrive on their own. So then we uh, manage the ecosystems that those plants live in. And today, that management of ecosystems has reached uh, extreme levels. For example, uh, here in California, um, the eighty percent of all the water in California that's extracted is used for agriculture, and this is true worldwide. About seventy to eighty percent of all fresh water used by humans is used to grow crops. Um, and we, as you can see on the map a little bit, we've created this huge plumbing system in California. Uh, to move water to where plants grow. So we've <clears throat> really dramatically interfered in the, in, the, in the ecological processes of our planet in order to produce our food. And finally, the third Neolithic uh, strategy was to manage other people. So we have uh, societies that have been organized to increase food production. One of the, of course, Slavery is an example of that, which we uh, know from the beginning of our country. <clears throat> Centralized hierarchical systems that are created to extract more and more food. And of course, along with those social systems, go cultural systems, 
Uh, when we worked with the Hopi uh, tribe in Arizona, for example, almost everything that the Hopi do is related uh, to agriculture traditionally, and all, everything is also related to religion. Their agriculture is their religion. So <clears throat> the tremendous change in, in human beings, uh, technology, of course, was a, uh, used to create more control over nature and uh, became more control over people. Nutrition and health changed, and demography. Agriculture fueled increase in population. So even though people's health deteriorated because they weren't moving around as much, more, more uh, infectious disease, more uh, nutritional disease, um, because people's diets deteriorated with agriculture, but still, because of the supply of food, human populations increased because birth rates increased faster than death rates. And today, we have... Uh, extremes of social control over other people. For example, in this uh, 2013 diagram by Phil Howard, which shows the global organization of the seed system. And you can see that just a few companies, Monsanto, the largest amongst them, and then DuPont, control most of the seeds in the world. So this not only controls the social economic uh, system, but it also is, is an example of how this is embedded within control of the evolutionary system. Uh, this is controlling seeds. This is controlling also uh, the ecosystems through the technology packages that go along with these seeds. The result of all this, this Neolithic strategy, how do we deal with uh, the growing demand of people for food? Increased production. And this Neolithic strategy has been very successful overall since uh, the beginning of agriculture. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have a graph that shows the whole span, the last 13,000 years. Um, but if, oops, sorry. Uh, but if we look at this uh, graph here, just since the 1960s, and this is uh, through 2007, that half a century shows the general trend through agriculture, even though there have been ups and downs, but by and large, uh, and this is why people say, well, Malthus was wrong. Malthus was wrong because we can produce food faster than we produce people. And you can see, this is true. So, is the Neolithic solution what we need for the future? A key issue here is whether the future is going to be the similar to the past. Will the solution that worked in the past, this, this Neolithic strategy, will it work in the future? And I suggest that the future is going to be very different than the past. We are entering a period which geologists have been calling for the last few years the Anthropocene. Um, traditionally, you know, we live in the Holocene, which is the, the recent uh, epic, but because of the um, <clears throat> uh, research that shows the incredible influence of human beings on the biophysical nature of the planet, ge some, many geologists are now talking about, we really need to rename the current epic as the Anthropocene because human influence on the globe is so great that this is really a major new geological epic. And of course, as you can see, suggested by this image, one of the major uh, biogeophysical influences of humans is climate change. Oh, by the way, if you have questions when I'm talking, feel free to ask me. Um, you don't need to wait for all these questions at the end. If there's something that comes up and you want clarification, just raise your hand. That's easier to deal with it on the spot. So. I have a question. Yes. So, What's your name? Sienna. Sienna. Um, so, would a succinct definition of Anthropocene be human influence on the globe? Yeah, a biophysical, because this is a geological thing, but it has, as, as I'll talk about, it has many other 
I mean, this, is, this has become a hot topic, and so anthropologists and sociologists and economists are all talking, having conferences about what does the Anthropocene mean for economics? And, but, but it's origin, it's a geological term, yeah. Okay, thank you. There's uh, another term you yeah. used, uh, I think it means stone. Oh, Neolithic? Yeah. yeah, it means new stone, Neolithic. It means new stones, and the, that, the, that, uh, the name people give to that period of time when people first started um, growing crops in any amount because they started having new stone tools that were used for um, harvesting uh, crops. And so, so people, they call this the Neolithic because they notice in the archaeological record, here's a new kind of stone tool. So if you're using it to apply it to us today. Well, well, I'm, sa I'm today. saying this is the, the strategy of the Neolithic, which which changed human human environment and human human relationships in those three basic ways. That we started we started controlling the evolution of other species. We started managing ecosystems very intensively, and we started managing other people, all in the service of increasing food production, and that was the Neolithic. But those same strategies, I believe, characterize all of our subsequent, you know, changes in agriculture. So I, I just call that the Neolithic strategy. Yeah, good question. Um, so, so the point is, will this Neolithic strategy work in a planet that may be fundamentally different? <coughs> Uh, the, this is this is actually a graph from the 2007 IPCC report, the fourth uh, report of the internet. Uh, what is it called? The International <coughs> Panel on Climate Change. I guess so used to using acronyms, you forget what they mean. Um, so, but this is a very uh, very nice graphic because it shows basically this is um, 10,000 years ago on the on the x-axis here. And this shows the uh, atmospheric concentrations of the three major greenhouse gases over the last 10,000 years. In this, just, in this graph, uh, this is just a little, uh, this inset shows an expanded version of what that graph looked like over here. So you can see that when you look at a long time scale, we've got a classic hockey stick graph, right? When you look at a, when you look at a, a shorter time period, it's a, it's a, the slope isn't as steep, but you can still see that this is an exponential increase here. And so there seems to be, if this is all the information you had, it would be hard not to conclude, based on this, that human beings have been the major cause of um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the last millennia. <coughs> Uh, this is one. This is one cause of those those greenhouse gas increases. This shows land use change since 1700. The in red and the pink areas are the uh, agricultural areas, and you can just see, just looking uh, at this graphic, you can see how much the uh, area of the earth that has been given over to food production has increased. And the green areas? The green areas are uh, forests. Uh, you can see the key down below, savanna and so on. Uh, so it's mainly by conversion of those, those areas into the red and the pink, the agricultural areas. And of course, oftentimes this involves removing, uh, removing trees and shrubs and replacing it with annual crops. And so all the carbon that's stored in the roots and the above ground biomass of those plants then goes into the atmosphere. So what does the Anthropocene mean for our food supply? I, I define the zone as the place where the, where the demand of human beings in terms of not only of our population, but our consumption per person which is, has also been going up, 
uh, and the way we produce the food to feed people, in other words, the technology, the, the combination of these three things uh, determines our impact on the environment. And many people believe that we are in a, we are in what we call, whoops, we call the zone. There we are, we're checking it out. Are we in the zone? Have we reached a point where our impact on the planet is exceeding the ability of the planet to supply our food? This is a big question in the Anthropocene because we have had such a huge impact on the planet. Um, for example, climate change uh, is predicted widely to uh, increase, of course, the average temperature, uh, but also the variance. So uh, one of the characteristics of climate change is increasing variability, increasing average temperature, but also, especially at the hot end of the spectrum, but also increasing variabil variability. So this, of course, will make it harder to grow food, uh, especially in those areas where people already are having a hard time growing food. <coughs> and the demand, uh, one of those hockey stick graphs of increase in uh, atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases, those hockey stick graphs over the last years also look a lot like our population uh, graph. But as you can see, uh, this is super exponential growth. Well, isn't that going to actually answer the question, though? Because as all of these graphs are going up exponentially, and then we reach the carrying capacity of the Earth, then that graph is not going to keep rising, and presumably the others aren't either. It's all interrelated. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I guess, I guess, no, that's a good point, because uh, most people would say, looking at these things, this can't go on forever. Can this go on forever? So, I mean, isn't there an assumption here, this 13 billion people, that may never happen? Well, well this is 13 years, uh, average time in the last, these, these last, uh, since 1800, the no, average time. Matter. However many billion, that might not happen. Oh, it, we well, might have reached the population capacity of the planet as well. Exactly. Well, well <coughs> every war has been fought, and the religion was started because of overpopulation. And the patriarchy business is too. Uh, we have to uh, reduce our population, and before there was a depression or something like that. But in, in addition to that, like the depression in the 30s, we also adopt, uh, created refrigeration and better transportation system and airplanes and that sort of thing. So we are, like you said, it's our production has increased. We managed to produce so, so we can, we develop ways to increase our population in addition to reducing it. Yeah, I mean, this is, the, the, this is a, this, the, causa the causality works both ways. Yeah. And this is something that like plant breeders have argued about for generations, you know. Are we, if, as we produce more food, because the population is growing, does that stimulate the population to grow even more? Yeah. It, it seems like a logical, a logical conclusion to reach. When we think of our purpose of getting married and to have children. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we re need to redefine the purpose. <laughs> Uh, it's, this, is about, this is part of my mega point, is that in the Anthropocene, we really have to really reconsider some of our basic assumptions. Yes? Um, could you expound, you would, before you were saying how the plants can grow on their own, and I know it's like soil depletion, and, and they've been, you know, especially GMOs, of course, but like, is that what you were talking about, or other plants, can you? Like elaborate on like why. Well, like uh, like uh, uh, my favorite example is a, a corn plant. If you if you have a an ear of corn, ear of corn contains about 400 seeds. Um, when 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 you know when you're in the field as as we've been in Mexico, <laughs> sometimes at the end of the harvest, farmers miss some of the ears, and it starts raining, and the wind, 
so you're walking through the field and you see this ear of corn and all the 400 seeds are germinating and it's there and how many of those seeds are going to produce seeds themselves none of them because they're just for they can't there's competition for resources take it takes people to take those seeds and plant them mm -hmm. so this has been going on for 13,000 years oh okay it's not just it's not just the new the new crops are even more dependent on human beings so it's not inherent in the plants it's more like you're just saying the strategy evolving well, because plants, uh, when a plant, uh, for example, a plant, what do plants, plants photosynthesize. So they take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, they take sunlight, and they put the energy from the sunlight into carbon bonds in carbohydrates that we, we can eat, you know, sugars and starches that we can eat. But that means that the plant isn't using that energy to produce more leaves, to okay. produce more roots, to... So we're stopping with like... You know, cut it off at the past. Yeah, we're just saying, okay, this plant's producing all those resources, but we want to eat them. Oh, yeah. So let's make that plant make more what we want to eat. And in return, we'll protect that plant. We'll feed it. So, in a way... So do they become dependent on us for, for like, you know, fertilizing it? Yeah. Uh, so the, ne the next round needs that, and... It Next. Yeah, and so they, it weakens them in a way. Like. Well, it do, it makes them it adapts them to our okay. our conditions and not their natural wild conditions. Yeah. Could you say one more time when you were talking about the transition from a, like a rainforest to one of our agricultural mm -hmm. farms? Um, what's the difference in the kind of plants? And the difference with the root system? Letting well, when them? you have when you have like trees growing. Um, there's a lot of carbon stored in the in the biomass in the root system, and the trees are there more or less permanently. But when you come in and you clear, as we have in, through much of North America, we've cut down the forest. I mean, this whole cent the, the whole East Coast used to be forests, um, and we've cut all those trees down to plant corn and soybeans and strawberries and whatever, and so. Uh, all that biomass now is up in the air because the annual crops have very little carbon comparative, compared with the native vegetation. And also, what we do with conventional agriculture, we're tilling the soil. So we're, all the carbon that's stored in the soil is exposed to oxygen, which increases the microbial um, uh, activity. And so the, as typically when you start farming, you clear the trees and there's so much carbon in the soil and after as you farm it, the amount of carbon in the soil goes down, down, down. So we're putting that carbon up into the atmosphere. And some people have even, even tracked um, the beginning of anthropogenic climate change to the, be to the beginning of agriculture because they're saying a lot of land clearing went on as farmers started spreading out and they started clearing land, and so we really started, it wasn't just the Industrial Revolution, it was the Agricultural Revolution that really began anthropogenic climate change. And you can see here, uh, it, this makes the point that I, when I showed you those maps, this shows that most of the population growth, given current demographic trends, most of the population growth in the next um, 40 years or so uh, is going to be in those parts of the world that already are challenged with producing food. And those parts of the world like uh, Africa, like uh, South Asia, uh, Western Mexico, that are also going to be heavily impacted by uh, climate ch changes in climate, which will make it even harder to produce food. Uh, but not only is <coughs> population increasing. This, this graph uh, shows uh, population is this horizontal line here. These are per capita increases in different foods. If people were not increasing the amount that they ate, these lines would all be flat. So what the increasing slope of these lines mean is that not only are the number of people increasing, but the amount of food that each person increases is in, or, or eats is increasing. Um, and one of the things that drives this, of course, is the increasing consumption of dairy, 
uh, especially in places like India, uh, <coughs> consumption of meat, especially in places like China. Do you know what your source was for that? Uh, yes, it's an article by Rhea et al. Um, published last year. I can, I can, I try to put those on the slides, but I didn't always get them. But I'll, I'll uh, email me, Jerry, and I'll send it to you. Um, so, the qu the question is, how much do humans take? Uh, and this is this I, this is a great. Uh, this is a great um, graphic here. What this shows is this plots the metabolic rate for um, uh, mammals, and it uh, so it shows it shows uh, this didn't quite. This shows the mass of animals, and this shows their energy use. These are it's a log graph. Um, <clears throat> So, in other words, uh, this shows a pretty uh, linear uh, relationship, and so the, as the size of the animal increases, the amount of energy they use per animal increases, naturally. Uh, until we get to human beings, and then we see something very interesting happening, which is that uh, even though, of course, all human beings' size remains the same, the range of energy per capita increases dramatically here. The medium level of energy in industrial countries is 10 times greater than what would be expected for a mammal of our size. What do you want? Fossil fuel <laughs> is one major, one major uh, thing. Uh, People in countries near the top, in other words, like the United States, uh, we use uh, the uh, energy equivalent to two adult sperm whales. If, if we use this, in other words, um, the amount of energy per capita that we use is about the same as two sperm whales would use. So, how long do we have to figure out the solution to this, to, to be in the zone? to be in Anthropocene and being in this zone where it seems that human demands uh, are actually beginning to, or have for a, a bit of time, exceeded the ability of the planet to provide food sustainably. I mean, we're still providing food. The question is, are we deteriorating the planet as we do it? Uh, are we, uh, for example, uh, by over-irrigating, salinizing farmland, are we uh, mining uh, fossil aquifers so that water is no longer available? Are we, <clears throat> are we um, uh, killing off uh, huge sections of our oceans, including here off the coast of Santa Barbara with our industrial agricultural effluents that flow down our creeks into the ocean? So <coughs> is, is this, can we, are we in the zone? And if we are, how are we going to solve it? How long do we have? This, uh, this is a nice little parable, everyone. Four days. Read, read this and see what, what you think the answer is to the, this. It's the fourth day, right? <laughs> or actually before that. <laughs> so what day will the pond be half covered? Oh, half covered? The second, That's the question. The second day. Because they're going to wait until they all these animals got together. And they said, this kind of reminds me of the COP conference in Warsaw. All the heads of state, all the delegates from around the world get together and say, wow, we got this climate change, you know, it's kind of a problem. What are we gonna, well, let's see, let's, we, maybe, um, we shouldn't do anything too much right now. Let's just, you know, kind of, oh, we'll wait. They have six, six days. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, because you double it, you double each number on the sixth day, they have 16, they're 16 lily pods. That's how they get it. It's asking when they be together to resolve the problem. Day 29. Is that double it? Double it. On day 29, the pond will be half full. This is the nature of exponential growth, is that it doubles for every time period. So if you have exponential growth, that means day one, this is another famous parable, is the parable uh, comes from Asia, different Asian countries like Vietnam, where um, the parable is that 
uh, somebody has this bet and they say this fam fabulously rich king owns, you know, just like millions of hectares of rice. And someone bets him and they say, oh, uh, what about this? And he loses the bet. And so to pay off the debt, he has to put one rice grain in the first square of a chessboard, and then he has to double that in each square. And by the time he gets to the last square of that chessboard, those 64 squares, it's <coughs> more rice than he could grow in a thousand years in his kingdom. Yep. This is the nature of exponential growth. And our population has been growing super exponentially. Today, our consumption of food, uh, especially animal products, and refined sugars and so on is growing exponentially too. So you take exponential growth in population and you multiply it by exponential growth in consumption and you get super, super exponential growth. This is the nature of exponential growth and this is why it's probably not a good idea to delay uh, because you only have one day left. You only one day. Oh, oh gosh, we should have started earlier. Bye bye. So, in response to this kind of uh, thinking, uh, people have said, well, you know what? Maybe the Neolithic strategy doesn't, won't really work. So, I'm sure you've all heard of the sustainability revolution. It's something that's been, the, the term, the concept is something that seems to resonate uh, with everyone because uh, everyone across the board seems to have some kind of idea that we are uh, in a new kind of situation. And so uh, everyone talks about sustainability. If you look at the Monsanto website, if you look at the uh, US uh, DA website, if you look at the Greenpeace website, you'll see everyone's talking about sustainability. So this is a different kind of revolution. The sustainability revolution is, is, is is based on the assumption that the supply side Neolithic strategy doesn't really work in a new Anthropocene epic in the zone. <coughs> and so uh, the sustainability revolution is really about something different, at least according to some people. So the question is, how do we become sustainable? And uh, I've thought a lot about this, and <laughs> I don't have all the, I don't really have any answers, but I have some ideas. Um, so I think one of the one of the main things about sustainability that we have to understand is that it is a subjective concept. It's something that. Uh, it's a goal for the future, and because it's a goal for the future, that means it's something that uh, is based on values. For example, we could say, well, our goal for our food system is that everybody um, uh, have plenty of food, and we should, have, uh, we should have social programs like SNAP and so on that make sure that everybody has adequate food. You could say that that's a goal. You could also say, let the market do its magic, and just, we don't need social programs. And there are many today, for example, in this country, you probably know, who would <laughs> take that viewpoint. And they'd say, we don't need SNAP. We don't need these programs. What the market function. So it's, it's a matter of subjective values, what we decide we want the world to be like. And that requires us to talk to each other and agree on something. Because if everybody has a different idea, it's going to be pretty hard to make progress in a world that we all share increasingly with each other. But just as important as making the definition of, of, of agreeing on a definition, at least at, at some level, is that we need to be able to measure it. Because if we decide that we want to do something to reach a goal, and uh, we need to know if what we do is actually getting us toward that goal. There seems to be a couple ideas along this line. The United Nations, uh, uh, there are countries who are looking for balance, a way of achieving balance. And then the United States in particular is looking for a way to control. 
Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, they're very different. And, you know, it depends on, uh, you know, the, the way you define and the indicators you choose will lead you to, wh wh how are you going to change? If you think the world is not sustainable, if you think we're not going to be able to feed everybody, uh, then we need to change something. We need to have actions and policies that will promote our goals. And we need then to assess progress. Would we do something? For example, we say, well, we know there's a lot of malnutrition in Santa Barbara County. We need to do something to improve it. Let's say that's your goal. Well, how do you know that you're reaching that goal? Maybe your policy is, okay, let's have more farmers markets. Let's take uh, food assistance recipients to the farmers market and help them to buy food there, uh, EBT cards and so on. Let's do that. And how do you know that actually improving their nutrition? How would you measure that? Do you measure it by the amount of uh, EBT credits that are, are spent at the farmers market? Do you measure it by um, interviewing people? Do you do, um, uh, do you draw blood samples and do you do uh, you know measure height and weight of little kids? How do you do it? You need some indicator to know whether what you do is actually having the effect that you want it to have. So that's kind of the basic idea about sustainability. The thing that makes it so difficult, even more difficult, is that people think about it in very different ways. And I've uh, divided this into um, three different emphases. Economic, uh, environmental, and social. And for example, uh, it all uh, which emphasis you give to sustainability uh, will, dis will uh, determine who you think ought to be in charge. Uh, if you, the mainstream, this is, the, in other words, the people who run our world, believe in the economic emphasis, and guess who gets to make the decisions? <laughs> the economists. Uh, the economists are the corporations that you pointed out earlier. Well, yeah, I mean, the kind of, yeah, I mean, the, the economists run the corporation, so, <laughs> yeah, no, good point. Uh, uh, the, other, the other emphases uh, would say, for example, with an environmental emphasis, you would expect we have to, we can't let markets figure out how to do things because we know they're, uh, they're screwing things up. We need to protect the environment. So we need scientists to say, well, this is how many, uh, how much water you can take out of this aquifer. This is how much uh, uh, fertilizer you should be putting on these crops in order for this field to be producing food into the, into the future. Uh, if you're a social uh, emphasis, then you're thinking that the communities, the people need to be making decisions. We need to empower the, the citizens of the, of the world to, to decide for themselves what is the best way forward. So these three different emphases, uh, and, and I'm sure you can think about things that you've heard people suggest about solutions to the, to the food problem, and think about what kind of assumptions are they making about who should be running things. Uh, here's just a quick example of some of these assumptions. Um, uh, if this is the way uh, the world is set up right now, um, there's, uh, in the first world, the industrial world has most of the power and very few people, relatively, while the third world, or the global south, has most of the people, but very little of the power. Um, so the solution that the, like the United States, uh, the European Union, and so on, uh, the solution they have to the world food crisis is that a trickle-down solution, because they assume there is no limit to resources. We can just produce more. They're still clinging to the Neolithic solution. We can produce more food. So there's no need uh, for anything else. But if there is no trickle-down solution, then we need to have something quite different self-determination, revolution, redistribution of power in order to feed everybody, if the resources are limited. So you can see that if you think through the idea of the Anthropocene, it also 
forces you to think through these assumptions of the mainstream way the world works, which we are uh, used to uh, as used to as fish swimming in water. It just pervades everything. Uh, when since the last time you heard a news article saying, "Oh my gosh, um, the growth rate is increasing in our economy. This is terrible." <laughs> You ever heard that? <laughs> so, for example, the mainstream approach, the trickle-down approach, is food security. In other words, their idea is, okay, let's make sure there's enough food for everybody. Uh, markets will solve that, usually. Uh, the alternative approach is we need food sovereignty. The people themselves need to be in control of their food. They don't need to be at the end of a of a, a charity line, they need to be in control of the food themselves. <coughs> so, uh, what I'm going to talk about now, uh, briefly, is the, the economic emphasis, which is the one taken by the mainstream. Oh my gosh. Fortunately, this is a <laughs> symphony. The conductor is not throwing his baton at me. Uh, uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about the economic emphasis, uh, which is the mainstream approach. I think there was a question over here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. As you go through this, there are a lot of implications about jobs. Yes. Uh, because you say growth and everyone gets excited, that's because in Europe there's 25% to 35% youth unemployment, depression levels. So people are really desperate for jobs. So somehow that probably has to go through the equation. Maybe you can interview. It does. It interview does. It does. And uh, yeah, uh, just briefly, I think one of the one of the things that keeps the economy, uh, the, this jobs economic growth thing, is by labor productivity. We have an economy. Our stress is labor productivity. We're always trying to increase the amount per person that's produced. That means fewer jobs to produce the same amount. So it's a kind of a treadmill. Say so we want labor productivity to increase, that means fewer jobs, and we need we need economic growth. We need an economy that's growing faster and getting more efficient in the use of labor. But that's a never-ending thing. Where do you stop that? So so we need to rethink, do we really need higher labor productivity? Maybe we need lower labor productivity and people, more people employed. Because part of a big part of our increased labor productivity, of course, is such substituting human energy with fossil energy. So if we're talking about reducing fossil fuel use, one good implication of that is we could decrease human labor uh, uh, productivity by using less fossil fuels. So there's more people doing stuff. Yeah. Is there a difference between decreasing human labor productivity and just inserting more leisure time? Seems like they should be. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. yeah. But yeah I'll We're talk about it. Everything's so complicated. <laughs> um, part of it is part of it is what I'll talk about. Do we really need all the stuff we we have that we spend all our time working to get money to buy this stuff? We could maybe not. Uh, so anyway, this is this is uh, the 2010 G8 conference in Canada. Um, this is the mainstream approach. Um, they believe, they still believe, we're in the Anthropocene, but they don't believe that they need to give up the Neolithic strategy very quickly because they see that we can increase our uh, carrying capacity uh, even as human impact grows because we're so technologically innovative. Look, we've got transgenically uh, uh, engineered crops. We've got these huge irrigation systems. We have. To, who would have thought? 20 years ago, that everybody would be carrying a cell phone around. Who would have thought of that this it was just like, whoa. And so they, they believe that those same kinds of technological innovations are sure to happen. So we don't really need to worry that much about uh, growth. In fact, at the Rio Plus 20 conference um, last year, well, the main theme was green growth. Inclusive green growth. So they, they don't see these two things as disparate. They see sustainability, dealing with the Anthropocene. You can do it with growth, but it just has to be green growth. It has to be more efficient. 
the main path to green growth is increasing efficiency. What are they calling green growth then? If they're using technolo technology? Because they believe that we can, as this shows, uh, that we can, even as population is growing, even as ec economy is growing, our emissions per capita has been decreasing. Our emissions per unit of GDP dollars has been decreasing. So this is more efficient. We're producing more, but we're, we're having less of a, and, and of course this is just in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, you could talk about this in terms of other environmental effects. We're having less of an impact. We're getting more efficient. We can produce a dollar of GDP and do it by emitting less greenhouse gases. We can do it by using less water, less electricity, and so on. So this is the solution. Why don't they do that then? They are. Look, this is a historic trend. It is happening. We're getting more efficient. It is happening. The question is, is this adequate? Because even though they're more efficient, it's still growing. Pop population is growing. The emissions per capita is going down, but it's not zero. That means that emissions are growing. Emissions today are growing, greenhouse gas emissions today are growing faster than they were. Uh, they're increasing, the rate of increase is increasing. The chart makes it look good. So like why do you call it green? Really okay, this looks good. Uh, let, me, uh, let me just show you that this is, this is from Tim Jackson's book called Prosperity Without Growth, which came out in 2008, unfortunately just at the time of the economic collapse. This was based on a report he did for the UK government. And unfortunately, he was, uh, I just learned this the other day, uh, he was scheduled to do a major, uh, the, uh, the BBC was scheduled to do a major interview with Tim Jackson to talk about his book, Prosper Prosperity Without Growth. And the financial <coughs> collapse happened, and Ken Downing Street called up BBC and said, and, you're not going to do that. You're not going to do this guy. He's saying growth isn't good. No, no. We're all about growth because of the financial crisis. And this illustrates the kind of mental, economic, physical bind we're in where we cannot think beyond the Neolithic strategy. We can't think. How could we prosper without growth? And his point here in this graph is, if you think of the graph I just showed you, this is, this is the efficiency of our um, economic growth in terms of uh, carbon intensity. In other words, in terms of the grams of, of carbon uh, emitted into the atmosphere per dollar of GDP. Today, worldwide, that stands at 700 and, well, this is in, the, this is in 2007, it was about 768 grams per dollar of GDP. And this is all, you know, normalized across the world in terms of currencies. The United States is not on there? Uh, no, he's from the UK, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can imagine the US would be somewhere in here. I, I can't remember exactly what it is. Okay, so the UK is 347. That's about twice as efficient as the world average. Japan's even more efficient. But then, the, his point is these scenarios. If the world population grows to 9 billion people, and the same level of growth, which is about 2% a year, continues, and we are going to meet the 400 part per million goal of, of uh, atmospheric concentration greenhouse gas to avoid catastrophic climate change, then we would need to increase our efficiency, decrease our carbon intensity, only 36 36 grams per dollar of GDP. And if you consider social sustainability, if you consider equity, if you consider that we shouldn't just depend on trickle-down, we should actually encourage the growth of the economies of the poorest countries, then that means, and that's not saying they would have the same income, that's just saying their income would be growing at the same rate, we would need to increase efficiency so that we only emitted six grams. That's like 120 times more efficient than we are today. And as you saw in the last slide, we're increasing our efficiency. This is physically impossible. It's getting to the point 
of being a perpetual motion machine. You can't produce stuff without also producing emissions. You can't do things without having an effect. So the, the basic conundrum is, if we are in the Anthropocene, if we need to keep, I mean, 400 parts per million, Jim Hansen says 350 parts per million. Right. Bill McKibben, 350. If we go over that, game over. So this is a conservative estimate. So if we really want to do this, Tim Jackson says it just seems indisputable that we need to figure out how to stop physical economic growth. Yes? Okay. I worked around the food system a bit, and one thing I don't see in these graphs at all, while we talk about efficiency in production, the amount of wastage in the food oh, yeah. system is unbelievable. I grew up in Minnesota, the days on the farm where people grow their crops in tandem and everything else. As far as retention of what was grown was much higher. Today, the chain of restaurants, for instance, in Monterey, we figured that almost 30 to 40 percent of the food was thrown out. It wasn't even used. The amount of uh, uh, food that's lost in the production cycles and everything is horrendous. Okay, and so you're stealing my my main points here. <laughs> no, I agree. That's absolutely that's absolutely true. The FAO came out with a report two years ago that estimated worldwide we waste about 35 percent of all food. All yeah. food. Yeah. In, in, uh, in our country, the industrial countries, we waste most of it at the at the you know, the retail and the household levels, but also at the field level. They don't even track that in this country. We don't even know how much food is wasted in the field because it's plowed under. In the in the third world, most of the food is wasted at the production level and the storage level due to pests and so on. But yeah, that's a huge thing. And think that every pound of food that's wasted is also all the water, all the oil all the soil, everything that take to produce that is also wasted. What about the production of things like wine and tobacco and coffee and stuff that's not really food? That yeah, that takes I mean that's, uh, in, in California for example, one of our biggest crops is strawberries, you know, and we export a lot of this to Asia. So we're exporting, our, our vanishing water supplies are being exported to Japan, to Korea, in, in, in our strawberries. Strawberries are greater than uh, grapes? Uh, I don't know, but we don't export grapes. We export we export wine. Yeah, we export wine. Yeah, I'm just saying. Yeah, I mean that's a good point. I mean, do we have at some point? You see, this is the difference. The the economic emphasis would say if people have money and want to buy stuff, we sell it. This is the market. The market works its magic. People want to buy strawberries. Want to buy strawberries. Any environmental emphasis would say, wait a minute, we're running out of water in California. The snowpack is vanishing. We're not going to have reservoirs filled to irrigate with. They already had to reduce production by 30 percent in the Central Valley last year, last couple of years. So they would say, okay, we need to have some kind of limits that we set, not the markets, because the markets don't see the environmental limits. So, I mean, that's a big difference. From a social emphasis, people would say, we shouldn't be growing strawberries when there's people hungry. We should be growing food that's much more efficient to grow and much more nutritious. So there's very different ways of doing this. Uh, for marketing, uh, the people are just a cost factor. Uh, we're not really valuing people. Yeah, I mean, that's all. If, when you... Yeah, oh, I can go on forever. Let's not, <laughs> we'll, we'll have a chance to talk here. Um, so this is the social and environmental emphases. People who tend to take these tend to take an alternative approach to uh, the Anthropocene challenge, the challenge of being in the zone, emphasizing food sovereignty and so on, uh, emphasizing uh, the end of uh, corporate uh, control. And so they, their uh, model of the way the world works is, hey, we've already passed the carrying capacity, and we've already forced the carrying capacity uh, to, to uh, be reduced due to our over-exploitation. And so now, our champ, we're up here, oh my god, help. we've got to reduce our impact. How do we do that? Well, population, consumption levels, and technology. Um, so, uh, as this gentleman just said, one of the ways to do this is to decrease consumption. There seems to be plenty of room to decrease consumption, this is one of Tim Jackson's points, without really de depleting our, our quality of life. 
Uh, if you, for example, as often is taken as an indicator of quality of life is life expectancy, uh, you can see that as you increase the per capita consumption of energy, you get a big increase in life expectancy, but only up to a certain point. And after about 40,000 or so um, megawatt hours per person uh, per year, all of a sudden, we have all these countries consuming, consuming um, many times more power, but not having a greater uh, quality of life in terms of life expectancy. So there's room for reducing consumption a great deal uh, and still maintaining a quality of life. 